Hello. You probably recognize this shape by now. If it wasn't obvious, this is a circle, and I'm going to give this circle the equation x squared, uh, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, where r is the radius. r is going to be this distance here. r is what defines the circle, and this is the equation of a circle centered at the origin, and that's all we're going to worry about dealing with for now. If you uh, have taken geometry, which I'm sure you have by now, you'll know that the area of this figure, make it this orange space, the area of this circle is going to be the constant pi times the radius squared. But how can we be exactly sure of this, except that we've been told this over and over again, and it is empirically the case? Well, we can actually prove this learning some of the integration uh, techniques that we've gathered over the uh, past few videos. I'm not sure if they'll be out when you're watching this, but uh, hopefully if they're not, they will be in the future. Uh, we can actually use our calculus to prove that the area of this circle is going to be pi r squared. So how do we do that? Well, the same way that we take the area under any curve during uh, with uh, integration. So just treat the circle as a curve. But wait, integration under a curve only works when that curve is a function. And this, this circle here, this is not a function. There's an equation here, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, but it's not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So what if we change it? What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a different graph and work with me here. Oh, there's a dog barking. And this graph is just going to be a semicircle. And the equation here is actually going to be a function. It's going to be y is equal as a function of x is the square root of r squared minus x squared. And that's actually a function we can deal with. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use integration. We're going to find the area under that curve here. And then because we know that this is half a circle, I'm just going to multiply that by 2. And that's going to be equal, our, equal to our area. So how should we set that up? Well, finding the area under a curve, we know that we are going to do, it's going to look something like this. The area, I'm going to call this my green area. This is going to be area G, or area 1. And we're looking for area 2. So area 2 is going to be area 1 times 2 is going to be area 2. So area 1, that's just the area under that curve. So we are taking the integral from where are we going from? That's an important question. We are going from here to here, and that's going to be negative r on the x-axis to r on the x-axis. So we are summing from negative r because that's how far the circle reaches along the x-axis to positive r of our curve. And our curve is going to be the square root of r squared minus x squared and times dx, or with respect to x. And you should be familiar with integration by now. If you're not, maybe watch videos on that first. Uh, but I'm not going to be explaining this in its current state any further in this video, okay? So we're going to set this area up as the integral from negative r to r of the function there. y is the square root of r squared minus x squared with respect to x. And you can think of making all the, you know, the little like Riemann sums and then taking the limit and stuff, but this is what we're doing. So how can we actually solve this? Because we have it all set up. We just need to find this green area here and then multiply by 2, and we'll have the area of the circle. Well, all right then. I'm going to do a little something called trigonometric substitution then. I'm going to say, for the purposes of finding the integral, I'm going to say that x 
is equal to r times the sine of theta. And you can think of theta as some just some variable. It doesn't exactly matter that it's theta, which is what we usually use for angles, except that um, because of the way the sine function works, it's we're treating theta as an angle anyway. So it just kind of makes things more intuitive. But I'm saying that x is equal to r times the sine of some quantity theta. That's basically being used as an angle. So there are a couple new things that I also want to say. I want to say that theta, in that case, is going to be equal to the arc sine of x over r. Right? That's an equivalent statement. That's fine. And lastly, I can say that dx d theta, the derivative of x with respect to theta, is equal to the is equal to r times the cosine of theta. Or if I want to get super fancy, and I'm not going to go into why exactly this works, we know from trig substitution that another correct way you can write this, oh dear, no, don't do that, is that dx, and you can actually substitute it in this way, you can think of it like we're multiplying both sides by d theta, is going to be r cosine of theta d theta. So now all I'm going to do is just plug this in. Let's see if that helped us. Uh, spoiler alert, it helps us. So this is going to be the integral from, well, now wait a minute. Before we had the integral from x is equal to negative r to x is equal to r. But now we're dealing with theta. So I'm not going to break this down into an indefinite integral and then solve that and then plug all this stuff back in. I think it would be much easier if we just went straight forward with this and converted all the x's into thetas, because why not? So I'm going to say we know that theta is the arc sine of x over r. So when x is equal to well, when x is equal to uh, negative r, then we know that theta is equal to the arc sine the arc sine of x over r, which is going to be negative r over r, which is going to be negative 1. All right? And we, of course, know that that is equal to negative pi over 2. OK, what about when x is equal to r? When x is equal to r, theta is equal to the arc sine of r over r, which is going to be 1, and that's going to be pi over 2. So really, when we change things to theta, we are taking the integral from theta is equal to negative pi over 2 to theta is equal to pi over 2. Now let's plug in for the rest of the function because we got that part down. That seems all right. So now we have the square root of r squared minus, well, what's x squared going to be? That's going to be r squared sine squared theta. All right. And then we're multiplying by dx, which is actually we found the same as r cosine of theta d theta. And this is our new integral in terms of some variable theta. And it's actually going to be easier to solve than perhaps it looks at this very moment. OK, so what's our first step here? Well, one thing we can do is pull out this r. I'm going to give myself a little bit more space. We're taking the integral. I'm just going to write negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of, we can actually just pull out that r and make it r times the square root of 1 minus sine squared of theta times r, wait, if I'm multiplying by r twice, why not just multiply by r squared? That seems simpler. So we're multiplying by the cosine of theta. OK, simple enough so far. And then, of course, we have our d theta. I'm going to have to move down a little bit. Let's see, oh, no, I don't have any space down there. OK, I may have to erase some stuff. Let's erase some stuff. Uh, I hope you have, if you're taking notes, I hope you have the notes written down, because I'm going to erase some of our trig substitution stuff, since we know that this is what we're dealing with right now, and we don't actually need to substitute anything in anymore. Uh, so we're going to have. I'm going to bring this over here. We are going to have the integral. 
And I'm going to pull that r squared out, actually. Because it's a coefficient, we can just pull it out. And we're going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of, we took our r squared out, so all we have is square root of 1 minus sine squared theta, which is actually cosine squared theta, if you remember from our uh, Pythagorean identity. But we're taking the square root, so this is really just going to be the cosine of theta, this whole quantity here. So of cosine theta, but we're multiplying by cosine theta over here too. So we're actually going to be taking the integral of the function cosine squared of theta with respect to theta. OK, all of this has gotten a lot simpler, as I think is pretty clear. So how do we find the integral of cosine squared of theta d theta? This isn't one that we memorize. You know, we can't think of a function off the top of our heads, probably, whose derivative is cosine squared of theta. But we can manipulate this a little bit with trig identities to get where we want to go, I think. So I'm going to change colors here just to uh, make things more clear. I'm going to go with red. So we have that our green, well, our green area is going to turn red for a moment, OK? I'm just going to write it in red so that it's clear that we're kind of in a new step here. So we have r squared times the integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. This is obviously getting a bit messy of what's another way to write cosine squared of theta? Well, we that's actually equivalent to cosine of 2 theta plus 1 over 2. And of course, we have our d theta on the end. And all of a sudden, this is a whole lot easier. Because now, all we have to do is, I mean, we can pull that uh, 1 half out. We have r squared over 2 times the integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of the cosine of 2 theta plus 1 d theta. That 1 is obviously going to become a theta. And of course, this is in uh, this is a definite integral. So I may have said indefinite integral earlier when I meant to say definite integral. I hope I didn't. But uh, we're dealing with a definite integral. So we're not going to have to worry about the constant here because we're, you know, we're summing from negative r to r or uh, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, right? So that's not a thing that we need to be concerned with. So what this is going to turn out to be is r squared over 2 times. I'm going to, I'm going to integrate this. And if it's not obvious exactly what the integral of one of these is yet, I think it will become obvious in a second. Well, what is it then? The integral of cosine of 2 theta is going to be sine of 2 theta over 2. I think that that's probably a little obvious. Take the derivative of that. You'll get cosine of 2 theta divided by 2. And then you have to multiply by the derivative of that inner function, right? That's a chain rule. That'll cancel out the 2's. You get cosine of 2 theta. And then, of course, we're adding theta. And we're taking this from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. OK, we're almost there, almost done. And I'm going to switch back to green because it's starting to get exciting. We're almost at the end of our journey. I'm going to erase some more stuff just so we can finish this up. And I feel bad about erasing this stuff. I want it to be beautiful, but I forgot to make the screen larger. So you're going to have to bear with me there. Just don't forget, we're looking for the green area. Yeah, I'll just I'll get rid of all of this. Just destroy everything all of our beautiful work. So our green area, which is, I'll just say that's now the red area. Yeah, we're dealing with the red area now. Sure, why not? So this is going to be r squared over 2 times, first we need to plug in pi over 2 here, and then we need to subtract our expression when we plug in negative pi over 2. So what is it going to be for pi over 2? That's going to be sine of 2 times pi over 2 divided by 2 plus pi over 2 minus 
Now we plug in negative pi over 2. Sine of 2 times negative pi over 2. Oh my gosh, running out of space, running out of space. I'm going to separate that out. Uh, minus pi over 2 over 2. Okay, we're so close to being done now. So close, I promise. I'm going to simplify this a little bit. We, we have r squared over 2 times what do we have in these first inner brackets here? We're going to have sine of pi over 2 plus pi over 2 minus sine of negative pi over 2 minus pi over 2 and then we have bracket here and bracket here I forgot the outer bracket on there there we go so wait a minute sine of pi sine of negative pi these are both gonna be 0 that's just 0 so these whole first parts of the expressions disappear and if all of a sudden things are probably getting really obvious now we have r squared over 2 times pi over 2 minus negative pi over 2 right we're subtracting negative pi over 2 subtracting negative pi over 2 that's going to be the same as adding pi over 2 so we get r squared over 2 times pi but wait a minute that's pi r squared over 2 we are looking for an answer of pi r squared. The area of a circle is pi r squared, not pi r, pi r squared over 2. Wait. Wait again. I know we're waiting a lot now, but trust me, it's trust me, it's exciting. So we're actually looking for that orange area. We know that area 2, we're looking for the entire area of the circle, is going to be 2 times that area one the red area remember the red area was just the area of a semicircle so if we double it we'll find the area of the complete circle and now it's probably clear that the area of a circle is going to be equal to two times that our red area right this was after all that hard work equal to area one for all that hard work we have two times pi r squared over 2, which is just going to be pi r squared. There we go. We have proven using integration of a semicircle with some trigonometric substitution and stuff. And this is not the quickest way to prove the area of circle, but it's probably my favorite way just because of how straightforward it is in terms of like intuition and how we've actually learned to take areas under curves. There's a bit of a quicker way that's kind of like just a different approach to looking at it, but I thought that this was really cool, especially the first time I did it, um, back when I was learning how to do this, and I was just curious to see if it would work, and obviously it did. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video and are now comfortable telling people that the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. Thanks for watching.